It's the fruits that come out of the church are enough to become an inspiring conversation to change the narratives of the rest who would look back and say when when the gospel went there we saw this change this trans, this tra transformation and that's the beginning of the conversation you can judge my fruit I don't, I don't agree that Africa has a dearth in leadership. I really don't believe that's true at all. I think that, I think that there, is, there are a sufficient number of very capable um, young people in the continent. So I, I don't believe that there is a, there is a, 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 a quantum problem. Um, that notwithstanding, I do think though that my estimation would be that the biggest challenges young Africans face today is we don't have the courage to liberate ourselves from our liberators. So no matter where in the continent you go, typically you'll find that the people seized with the responsibility of leading those people have liberated either those people, which is in my country, or those people forefathers, if you're in Ghana, say. But what the young people lack today is simply the courage um, to liberate themselves from those very liberators who gifted us the promise of this free uh, continent that we face today. So if we, if we don't do that, then it'll always present itself as a Africa has a leadership crisis. So I want to be very clear. Africa, in my opinion, does not have a talent crisis. We don't have a competent people crisis. We don't have an intellectual ability crisis. We don't have any of these as crises. The only crises we have, frankly, is that young people don't understand that, that power is contestation. And that we're just not ready in numbers to fight for the contestation of our futures. And ultimately, I was speaking at a conference the other day in Nigeria, and I said, I think our generation is the one that's got to make the decision about to what are we going to be loyal? The past from which we come or the future that we want. Because we're at the point where we can't be loyal to both. Right. And how does fighting for what we want look like to you? Well, I think that's precisely the point. Often hear people hear the word fighting, and that gets, that, that gets particularly those in power, it gets them nervous, as it should do, right? I think the very idea of fighting is the recognition that it's not going to be given willingly. And we can't ask for it. So there's no asking for it. We can't ask for it. Um, that does mean we need to find a creative, necessary, but belligerent means to seize power. I just want to be clear, it has to be belligerent. I'll give you guys an example. I work in capital markets. I've been running the, around the world for 15 years talking to global investors about talking to Africa long before Time Magazine was talking about Africa rising as a thing. Some of us were talking about the actual rise of the continent. The biggest challenge we had wasn't the global community, the biggest challenge we had were the local authorities in different countries who recognized that if Africa did rise, the youth who would rise with that and the, and the dividend that would result from that would often shake the very levers of power they sit on. Most of us in this room come from countries where you know in the election season because suddenly the people running for power are showing up with food parcels and t-shirts. And so what I mean by this contestation is that young people have to contest the right to determine for themselves the worth of their own lives. And no matter where we are, that's what we have to figure out how to do. I think the contestation is going to be different in different parts of the world. You're seeing it happen in the Sahel region of the continent now. You may have feelings or views about that. Some people even have feelings or views about what's behind that. But what is pretty clear is that you have a generation of young people who are saying, it's pretty clear the past template of the past 50, 60 years hasn't worked. And so we need to rethink what the template of the next 50 to 60 years looks like and what role are we each going to play with regards to it. It's a contestation. It's going to be difficult. And what I think we need to figure out is by different country, by different regions, given different nuances, what are the various things we each need to do? Maybe to push back a little. What then do we take of the failure of probably our governments to provide basic services, right? In places where those probably once existed. I'm from Zimbabwe, so. Oh, boy. 
Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. H how then do we sort of define leadership in those contexts? Leadership might not look the same, especially we have Asian countries. Would they have proved that you can have a different non-Western leadership and still have a, a, probably the economy that works perfectly, or maybe not as perfectly, but a growing economy, the Asian Tigers, China now ri rising and probably going to be the next big economy. So those are examples of how they adapted to their own environments, taking mm -hmm. into context their own cultures and their rich history, but still deliver something to their people. And I think for most African youths, the problem becomes we are all, we we actually take a pan African approach. Mm -hmm. We understand all the evils the West has done. Mm -hmm. We push back against their their idea of democracy, mm -hmm. but we still feel that our leaders have let us down. Mm -hmm. So how do we sort of reconcile that? I, I want to venture a thought on this, and and, and please excuse me if I'm stepping outside of the guardrails that you set for this, this conversation. But I suspect that a part of the problem is that we don't have a uniform understanding of what it is we mean by leadership. Right. And as a consequence of this, we assign managers leadership roles. Mm. They're not leaders, they're managers. There are many presidents in Africa who are managers, they're not leaders. They can't imagine a future. They can't inspire a people. They don't have the courage to take the necessary action to make those things real. This is, this is true for much of the continent. So one of the things I think we have to do in the conversation is to recognize that we are perhaps the first generation that actually has a real chance and probability of leaders that can affect change in the continent from outside of it mm -hmm. and who are not in political office. Mm -hmm. This is the first time I can't imagine in how long where that is actually plausibly true. You see it too, when a number of these managers who are in leadership positions face a contestation from outside of the echo chamber where they have seized power. You notice how they respond. There are examples of plenty, we don't need to mention them, about how it is they react when they find that there is an affront to the institution of power that they have seized. I, I, um, I spend a lot of time in your homeland of, of Zimbabwe, so I must be careful how I frame this next <laughs> statement. Um, but I, I will say to you that in my mind, the conversation is not, is not a tenure conversation. It's not a talent or competency conversation. It's a simply defining when we say we have a leader in place, what is it that we mean? Because leadership is clearly not an office. It's not a job. It's not a business card and it's not a title. So when we say there is a leader in place, what precisely is it that we mean? I'll, I'll give you a quick example, and you mentioned it the apostle the other day over lunch. I often get on my social media people saying, you should X, Y, Z. And the X, Y, Z is typically run for office. Now, I, I must be careful how I frame this, but I'm not being called to get into a position of power because they think I would be a good leader. It's because they're noticing a leadership behavior and they believe it should seize a position of power. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we talk about leadership in the context of Africa, the first, the first test for us is just to agree, what, what do we mean by a leader? And then the second test is to say, and what do these leaders, what should they deliver to their people? What should they truly deliver to their people? Is it give me liberty or give me death? Or is it simply a better chance at tomorrow? Because it's entirely probable that you can have a better chance of tomorrow without liberty. Mm. Read uh, Dambisa Moyo's book, The End of the West, for instance. It makes this point very, very clear that the ascension of what you've seen from the East, the ascension of China, has been antithetical to the America's idea of give me liberty and give me death, or give me death. Mm -hmm. That it is entirely possible that I can live a life that I want to live, to your point about what's happening in the UAE, and this instrument of liberty that we believe to be foundational in the West is actually not a part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So when we say leadership, what is it that we mean? And um, until that question is answered, see, see, I suspect we're going to spend a century running around the same merry-go-round, and every single generation will find itself a group of managers who have the instruments to seize power, 
and use that power to authorize themselves leaders. And the young, competent, capable people will board that flight with a return ticket and no intention to use it. And they will go to another part of the world where they believe they will have the better chance at life. Precisely because we have given the wrong people the, the opportunity to lead us. Right. And one last point. It's precisely why I say it's going to be a contestation. Because it's pretty clear I'm framing questions and not giving answers. Which means to each of us, there must be a way to find those answers. And answers can only be found in contestations. We have to argue, engage, agree, disagree. We have to find different models of how things work. In my country of South Africa, for instance, we have a strong, very strong tribal leadership community. Very strong tribal leadership community. And so the question you now ask yourself is, so who is, who is seized with leading a particular community? Is it the state that has the state functionaries to exercise power and authority? Or is it this uh, tribal chief, king, who is given um, God, God endowed rights, it is their belief, to exercise leadership over a people? Who truly is the center of who leads these people? You had it yourselves, Abosan. So there are things I believe that in that context can empower certain conversations. But these things are a little different when you come from a third world country. Uh, and, and probably I'll, I'll, I'll pose this as a question to ponder through because these are the things that have always gone around my head. Is this perceived lag we see concerning the African continent, uh, as what they may say, it has failed to align itself to the leadership patterns of the developed world. The story said that we have failed as a, na as a continent to align to the developed patterns of, I mean, the, the patterns of the, devo the developed world. Mm. And, and I always ask myself, is it because we are inherently inadequate or is it because the paradigms of leadership in these nations, developed nations, mm -hmm. quite cannot connect or Africa has failed to assimilate to the frameworks mm -hmm. that were not inherently suitable for her unique context? Was leadership a problem in Africa predating colonialism and our times. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do we have leader did we have leadership problems mm. in Africa before colonialism came? Before the white people came to tell us what leadership looked like? Look at um, let's define a simple topic like moral values. Mm -hmm. You know? From our context and our history, there's a way we understood many aspects of life, right? And with all due respect, the West had its own understanding. They have their own orientation, right? When you bring a conversation like democracy, what does that mean? Does that mean that because a nation is democratic, therefore it has the best leaders? Well, I'll give reference to places like Saudi Arabia, UAE. Right. Al Maktoum has been the vice president and prime minister of the United Arab Emirates since 2006. That's 18 years. In the context of America, it would not work because how would you be a prime minister for 18 years? Or Al Zaid, who just passed recently and his son took over in 2020. This guy had been, you know, president of the Emiratis for again up close to 20 years of leadership. We could say, in that context, from a Western perspective, that this is uh, a dictatorial government. Sorry? Oh. You were saying something? No, I was going to say. That there's this the idea of religious organizations being central to at least defining um, life. Mm -hmm. Would that translate as well to non-Christian countries? Mm -hmm. I think the point is begin by making it work, right? And if it can work through, the Bible is very clear. You'll know them by their fruits. The fruits that come out of the church are enough to become an inspiring conversation to change the narratives of the rest who would look back and say when when the gospel went there we saw this change this tra this tra transformation and that's the beginning of the conversation you can judge by fruit judging by fruit all right i would like 
to take questions from the audience. I still have plenty, but I want you to get an opportunity to get your questions in as well. So do we have people with questions? I see a hand. I see another hand. All right. Oh, there's a hand over here. Thank you so much. Um, Maybe so you can say your name first. I'm Bishop Jones, should I stand? What's it? Go Everybody ahead. else is yeah. sitting. <laughs> uh, okay. I'll stand for you, Bishop. All right, this, <laughs> we're wearing the same clothes. Uh, no, no, my, my, I'm Bishop Jones. Uh, my ministry, Global Justice Ministries, um, we have an office in South Africa. Not been to Uganda yet. I'm um, also student at HKS, uh, Center for Government. Um, this question is for both, Apostle as well as for Lucy. Um, my ministry is largely centered around developing leadership in and around the African continent. We spent almost 15 years in South Africa, I have a house in South Africa. My wife is also South African, just so you know. I know. You do know these things, so I didn't know if you know them as well as I know you. So, uh, uh, this. Uh, this campaign that we have had, Apostle, for, for global social justice involves this very thing on leadership and leadership development and how we bring better leadership to South Africa through the use of the principles that have been taught in our Bible. And as you said, um, we, they are general principles that, that can apply in any region if, it's, if they're applied correctly. Um, my concern is that the church has not been properly taught how leadership should look, to your point, Fusi. That we can develop a culture of leadership based upon a proper orientation of the people who are electing the leaders. Because the leaders are being elected largely in South Africa by the Christian church. And the Christian church has largely not been given the proper understanding of what real righteousness looks like based upon what we have been taught in our, in our Bibles. And so our campaign has largely been about how do we change the dialogue, you know, how do we use those two and a half hours every Sunday morning mm. to bring about a better understanding of what it means to be righteous mm. in a common, uh, sorry, a contemporary context. Mm. And what does it mean to, how does it change the dynamic of leadership, uh, the, the profile of leadership mm. based upon what we have been taught scripturally? And um, my question for you is, um, do you see, you know, that sort of a campaign mm. as being a way forward for other nations even outside of South Africa, but especially in nations that have adopted, you know, the by majority vote Christianity as their favorite religious scripture to sort of use and guide in shaping of moral leadership. And um, whether or not uh, we are able in this season to forfend against the pushback that we get from other nations that say, hey, no, we must have, you know, uh, we must be an interfaith yeah. approach. There must be an interfaith approach to, you know, to leadership because there's so many different religions and we have to entertain them all. Yeah. Understanding that, you know, democracy doesn't require plurality, it just requires majority. majority. The majority of the people should choose and decide who and what we're going to use as our primary not exclusive, but our primary focus for leadership. So uh, the question is for both men. So Amen. Uh, if you could give us some guidance in that area, I'd greatly appreciate it. So good. So should we take another question and have them answer two questions? Okay, I'll take it. So can I go for a minute? Okay. <laughs> that was good. There was another hand over there. Hi, uh, my name is Bradley. I'm a sophomore here at the college. And uh, my question is for you, Vusi. Um, so I'm trying to start a software company in Zimbabwe. So I would like to, I would like to recognize myself as one of the future leaders that you were talking about. Um, and my question is that, for example, um, Starlink is not allowed in Zimbabwe. Yeah. And I'm trying to start a software company which requires good internet. Um, and this, this, this rule is put in place by the government. So me as a leader, yes, I'm trying to do this thing. I'm trying to start a company, but the government has these things in place that are stopping me 
from actually um, building this company. Um, so it's basically like a, an infrastructural uh, obstacle to what I'm trying to do. So how would you suggest that, you know, people like me who are actually trying to do something but are stopped by these, I guess, guardrails that are put in place by the government. How do we go about that? How do we find a solution to that? <laughs> me first, okay. Um, Bradley, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you now? I'm 22. Right, welcome, <laughs> welcome. And I, and I say welcome because, um, do I need to use both? Yeah. Both? Yeah. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> use one. Sound. You'll have the sound. Yeah. Yeah, but when you there is a signal issue. No, it's yeah. these two. Is it these two? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is how <helping>. yeah. <laughs> Just this one. Thank you, man. So, um, Bradley, <laughs> I forgot where I was going to go. Um, that's a meme. Did you see that? That was a meme with yeah. both of them. Um, Bradley, I, I say welcome because what you've just described is precisely what it is I'm trying to describe by this contestation. When I hear young people say things like, I will not be allowed, there are so many lights that go off in my head. The first is allowed by whom? The second is disallowed against which rule? And the third is disallowed because it does not benefit whom? Bradley, what you're describing is not new. There are countries where in the continent we have found a potential transaction and we want to participate in the transaction. And we go through the entire process, the whole due diligence, and there's a capital call. And then all of a sudden you're told you're not allowed to participate in this transaction, national interest, security interest, right? And, and you're not told by whom and against what agenda. And, and then in not too far from that time, Something breaks in the news and a certain startup that was operating in that space has been shut down by the government. S several of these have happened in West Africa, in, in, in a particular country in West Africa from which our host comes from, for instance. A very exciting fintech startup was shut down by the state precisely because they were working in the world of alternative currencies to enable people to transact. And this just didn't fit the agenda of the people in power at the time. Bradley, that no one's going to allow you. That's precisely what I'm trying to describe. And it's this idea we have as young people, right, that we must just go and get a good education and come back to Africa. And all of a sudden, doors will open and they will allow you. No, they won't. I want to share with you something a mentor of mine shared with me that fundamentally changed my perspective. Because I used to get ulcers, literally ulcers on this. And he said to me, you know, the body has an immune system. Yeah, the immune system at, at, at protects the body against an attack of a foreign object. All societies have an immune system, even dysfunctional ones. And if you come in from the outside and want to do things differently, you must fully expect that the immune system is going to fight back. The system is going to fight back. It's the nature of these things. The difficulty for young people like yourselves, Bradley, is whether or not you're willing to spend 10 years of your life fighting for something where you might at the end of it, if you win, create the kind of wealth you could do here in three months. That's the real contestation. And so what we're seeing are young people who say, I love the idea of going back, but I look at the current country, I look at the currency, I look at the trajectory of the currency to country, I look at the macroeconomics. You know what, frankly, I'm, I'm pretty good for me to stay by here and, and do okay here. And so what I, what I pray for young people like yourself, Bradley, is that what the cause that calls you is bigger than the reasons not to do it. Because until you are convicted, absolutely convicted, there is nothing Vusi is going to say in a room that will say, wander into, into the abyss and go and make it work. It's, it's just not going to happen. But I, I, I pray that you find conviction. Before I hand over to Apostle Bishop, I want to say to the comment that you made earlier, Bishop Jones, for those of you in the room who don't understand how colored what Bishop Jones's um, um, contribution to this conversation is, is this. Even in my beautiful country, and I want to be clear, I love my country. I'd, I'd have it no other way. Even there, it, it's been the lack of courage in the church, the lack of courage in the church to speak against that which is not righteous. And the church has allowed itself to become a pulpit platform 
with those who enjoy power at that time. For whatever reason this is, Bishop. And so it's, it's, it's curious that people go to the church and they pick up this thick leather-bound book and they read in it all of these principles. And the minute they walk out of the door, it's almost as if righteousness is only allowed to exist inside those four walls. They go into society and they perpetuate exactly what it is that they were talking about in the church. And so to Apostle's point, it's about us going back and asking the question, where is the church? Is it in the building or is it in society? And frankly, I, I would venture to say that if you lifted your eyes above a particular de denomination, you'd find that the values are universal. Yeah. Right. And the reason they have been leaders, the likes of which I had the incredible privilege of meeting Nelson Mandela, the likes of which is an MLK, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, is precisely because they lifted us above a particular denomination and they showed us the universality of those values. What's a lack today is leaders who can do that. <laughs> Lastly, particularly in South Africa today, which for those of you who don't know, South Africa in my mind is on a contestation for its soul. That's really where we are. 30 years we've been run by the, the, the government of, of the party of Nelson Mandela. And by all polls, it's, it looks as if in a month's time or so, they will, for the first time since Nelson Mandela ascended onto those steps in Pretoria at the Union buildings, lose the majority power. And in that contestation is the fight for the soul of the nation. Now, those who are not spiritually wound don't see it. They simply see an array of political parties with different ideologies. But once you look at it and you look at it intently, you realize that this is a fight for what will be the soul of South Africa because... When South Africa wins, Africa wins. This is the power of my country. We are the most industrialized nation in the continent, bar none. We have the most um, well-developed capital markets in the continent, bar none. A legal framework that's miles ahead of all the other counterparts in the continent. If South Africa wins, Africa wins. And so the, the real contestation you are seeing in South Africa, the issue around the leadership, is in my mind a simple, small microcosm of what you're seeing globally. The world is in a fight for its soul. South Africa is in a fight for its soul. And that's why leaders stepping up, Bradley, is so important, so important. The ability and the courage to say, I'm not sure where this goes, but I feel convicted to do this. And I feel convicted to go where no man will tread. Because my friend, you must know that that path is very narrow. Awesome. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, now, to Reverend, again, I think the biggest challenge that I face is to try to give language to a question that I believe even language would not suffice to be able to both ask or interpret. If you are spiritual, anybody in this room, if you are spiritual, you'd understand this, that some things are so hard to... The human language has no power to put in words, mm -hmm. but, but the spirit can feel. And I think that's the pain generally that a certain group of people finds. I have seen as a minister, my generation has asked the exact question, how can a man of God call something righteous, which is evidently not righteous. Mm. And he has scriptures to vindicate him. In his world, he's right. If he's 70 and 80, and I'm 39, where do I even begin from to turn to a hoary head and say that you are wrong without being seen as one who is you know, breaking the order and pattern of things. But rightly said, I feel that, and I know you confirm this, man of God, that God across the world is drawing people with the same conviction and forming sort of a tribe that's going to bring this conversation out in the open with the language that we need. And I believe that supernatural help has to come through to position right some of these voices in the places where they must be heard. 
and disqualify some of the other voices mm -hmm. because I don't see any other way this can change unless God comes through and says, by my own will and purposes, I'm going to position the right people who really have the language and heart to fight for what is true. Because look at a, 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 a case where even as clergy or men of God or ministers of the gospel have come to a place where we have compromised what the very Bible we preach speaks, right? And passed laws within our structures that even folk who don't know God would question whether we know God. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? And this is a person holding some of the highest office somewhere in, in this sect. Where we begin from to even say that you are wrong except God will raise sort of a dispensation where what they have is not enough to appeal to the people that matter and gives us the language to be able to appeal to those people and then bring change. I don't know if I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. And the good news is everywhere I go and in every country that I go, I've started to find people speaking this language. That's the good news. In Africa, if you look at the younger generation that is coming up, men and women of God, whom God has anointed distinctly, you realize that they're starting, I might not mention names, but they are starting to speak the same language. When we sit and talk, they, we understand each other. And I believe it's out of that collective uh, effort that God is going to build deliberate synergies. And I pray to God one day I have the opportunity to have a cup of tea with you. Because I, I feel what you're saying is it's, it's, it's a conversation that is so hard to explain and unless we dig through many layers. But the good news is our tribe, our kind of people are mushrooming up from different parts of the world. And I feel that this is going to be a very deeper conversation. And lastly, I can attest to this, that even in parts like the United States of America, where you think, ah, things are falling apart, I have met people who are really aligned, mm -hmm. who still carry the truest convictions about this conversation. And I believe that in building this template that we're talking about, if God can just help us build these synergies and build a tribe out of this, and by his grace, allow these tribes to spread across the world, the change is inevitable. We have a question, two questions, one over here, one over there. Rosalind, do we still have time for your question? Okay. I'll be very quick. I'm any talk PG. Um, there's this uh, misconception that leadership is painted with perfection. Mm. Um, and a lot happens mm. in that leadership, in people's leadership journeys. Mm. But I've noticed that, you know, and it's one thing we encourage here at uh, I'm, I'm HKS, I'm from HKS, is to share leadership uh, failures. Um, and I would like both of you to share a leadership failure from your leadership journey that we could benefit from. Um, what lessons have you learned? What would you do differently um, if given that opportunity in that uh, similar situation? Um, yeah. Good question. It's a very good question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the beautiful words of wisdom you have given us. I like the idea of contestation that uh, Bosia has explained so well. I would like to ask uh, how far, how far is contestation too much <laughs> or enough? Because I come from uh, Uganda, I'll mention it. Uh, Pastor Grace is very careful not to mention. Uh, but I come from... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, because he's going back tomorrow. And <laughs> Hey, at least I'm still here for September. Uh, so the meeting might come much later than, uh, than his own, which might come tomorrow. So um, uh, in this country, the young people have really, really contested. Mm. A young man called Bobby Wine, a musician, basically gave up his career to, to contest and ensure that um, the old man destroying the country. Pastor Grace was very careful, he never mentioned names, so I'm mentioning the name. 
they can come for me, don't worry. <laughs> that the old man who has been in power for 39 years uh, does not return to office. 39 years. He came to power in 1986 when uh, Reagan was the president of this country. And since then, many people have come. And uh, in one of the in one of in the elections of 2021, 54 young men lost their lives. They were contesting for a space to change their country for the better. And the police opened fire on them. In the parliament, uh, when the president was changing a very important law, at first he changed the, the term limit law. The country was supposed to come up with a two term limit. The president changed that and, and of course a lot of trouble happened. The second time, the last safeguard we had for him to hand over to, the, to other people was the age limit. But beyond 75, you cannot become the president. And people contested in parliament, on the floor of parliament. And the army, the army came to the floor of parliament. Someone, someone's back was broken. There's a member of parliament whose back was broken in that contestation. And so in Uganda, we have really seen this contestation taking place every day. And as, I don't know who said it, the church has been on the side, mostly on the side of uh, the 39-year man in power. Apparently, one of his children is a pastor. And, <laughs> and the Bible, and the Bible is one of the, is one of the, of, of the instruments that he had used to, to, to stay in power for long. It's a different conversation. So I'm asking you, Bossi, um, how adequate is the contestation and when is the contestation too much to the level of people losing their lives? Thank you. Thank you. Let's first answer the two. Let's first answer the two. Oh, okay. Me first again? <laughs> yes. Best always. You get your favor. Okay. Ah, right, right. So, I missed your name, Mom. I'm Anito. Anito. Yeah. Anito. Uh, probably my my single biggest leadership failure. I, I want to say that I've not I've not always known how to exercise grace. Um. Yeah. In 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 in. In the 21st century of um, Uber taxis and Uber Eats, we expect everything now. And in leading people, there is a there is a process of fermentation that you have to allow the other person to go through. And um, I'm maturing into it certainly as I get older. But certainly when I was younger, I had very little grace for people very little grace for people. It must be said that I also operated in an environment and in an industry where that's rewarded. And so a lot of us, I think, um, this, is, this is often why I'm careful to call out uh, political leadership. You'll notice I've not used those words because, because even business leaders do the things they accuse political leaders of doing. Yeah. Right. Um, even civic leaders, do the very things they accuse business leaders of doing. Because the, there are certain, uh, um, there are certain human characteristics that are carnal, that are just part of the flesh. And if you approach the world with a particular outcome desired, and in today's world, it's not just outcome, but it's outcome now. That doesn't give you space for grace. Um, so when I was younger, I think I've, I've matured a lot more on this. I just didn't have grace for for people. Um, my my, I console myself when I read literature of other leaders, and then I realize I was just in the path that they were on. So, for instance, if you read uh, the 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 letters Winnie Mandela wrote Nelson Mandela, if you read about Nelson Mandela's own speeches when he was younger, he was not the magnanimous magnanimous man we know today. He was. He was hard, he was forthright, he was belligerent, he had very little grace for people. He wanted what he wanted the way he wanted it. And I think that there is a certain amount of, uh, you know, coarsity that time just washes out of the edges of your soul. 
and you learn to be a bit smoother with people. You'll notice the older people in your life tend to be calmer. They see things for what they really are. And, and so for me, that, that was a, a true, genuine leadership failing. Um, and I hope to improve on this. I will not even venture an answer on, on the Uganda matter. I, I, I will say, sir, I will say to you the following. Your question was, how much contestation is enough? That's like asking a fish, how much ocean is enough? It's like asking the human body, how much oxygen is enough? How much contestation is enough? It's never enough. It's as much contestation until you believe what you stand for and what you believe to be right is what you... Listen, in South Africa, we suffered apartheid for well over 70, 80 years. Before that, hundreds of years of colonization. Even today, in contemporary South Africa today, it's not as if just because I'm born young and black, I'm all of a sudden born equal. Because as you understand it, similar to how in, go in golf they have a handicap, if you're born into a system where oppression is baked into the system, you're born into a natural handicap. And so even in South Africa today, there's just certain things that if you're a young black female, you have to contest with. If you're young black female and disabled, you have to contest with those things. Even today, in a free environment, there is still contestation, right? The point is that contestation never ends. It never ends because the minute you come upon a particular freedom, you realize that that destination was just a vantage point for what next looks like. Um, I'm, I'm very careful never to be, you know, as a, as a, as a traditional, you know, Zulu Swati man, we're taught you don't speak about your neighbor's business. So I'm very careful not to enter the affairs of, of, of other peoples. But suffice it to say that I think that insofar as there are a group of people in a particular area who feel that there's something to contest for, then you contest for it. How much contestation is enough? More. And you contest until you contest, until you contest, until you contest. This very country we're in, the other day I drove past the Freedom Trail. I mean, just an extraordinary story of the things that, that, um, that had to be done for slaves to be taken from the South to where we are today. They didn't have an end date in mind. They couldn't have foreseen the Emancipation Proclamation, but they contested. And even after the Emancipation Proclamation, there were new things that needed a contestation. The point I'm making is that we can't be an Xbox PlayStation generation. We can't be a Twitter hashtag generation. This is, this is what frustrates me about my generation is we think Twitter hashtags is, is actually contestation. We think arguing under faceless characters on social media is actually standing for something. No, stand for something and stand for something. Mm -hmm. to, to be Bradley and stand here and tweet against Zimbabwe from Boston is of no consequence. Mm -hmm. You've got to be in the place to do the work yes. because it's easy to do it the other way. And I think what the, what, what the World Wide Web and the internet has allowed us to do is to divorce ourselves from the inconvenience of struggle but pretend to have struggle credentials. Oh, oh I support so-and-so from where? Your house in Boston? What are you doing? Sending money on a GoFundMe page? Get out of here. <laughs> like, that, that's not contestation. Right? It's, I think it's, it's really, yeah, no, you're offended. It's really, I think it's really, really, you know, it's, I, I live by that Theodore Roosevelt poem. It's the man in the arena. And so many of us are just not willing to get, we don't have the courage to be in the arena. We want to commentate. We are, we are experts on things. We know timelines. We know all of the injustices. And then we have a hot plate of lasagna and go to bed. We just, we don't have the courage of what this season calls for us to have. And, and lastly, I want to be clear, this is not just courage to confront political injustices. It's courage to confront economic injustices. If you are an African today, you know all too well what it is that I'm talking about. The way the global monetary system functions and works and what it disallows a lot of us to do. That's an injustice. We're not even talking about that. See what I mean by leadership? No one's framing that conversation because they're not even thinking about that stuff. The fact that there are nations whose entire mineral resources dwarf the GDPs of the most developed nations in the world, but the people in those countries are poor. That's an injustice. We're not having a confrontation conversation about that injustice. And a hashtag is just not going to do it. Uh, on, on my, my sister's question, I think one of my greatest failures in life, especially in my primal years as a leader, minister, was the thought that 
that could please everyone. You know, the, mm. the, there is a mindset that when you are very popular or the most popular, I could say we have the biggest church probably in Eastern Central Africa or, you know, like that. And I, I'm saying that in humility. There's the assumption that everybody understands you or that you are called to please and make everybody understand. And for me, that cost me quite a lot. Why? Because, you see, even in the Bible, we, we have these two terms. We have the called and the chosen. The price, the called and the chosen. The chosen. Bible says Go deep, up, up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the Bible tells us that, that many are called, very few are chosen. That there was many leaders in South Africa mm. called for the fight against the bad thing. Mm. But Nelson Mandela was chosen, chosen. distinctly mm. to be sort of a pioneer, a leader mm. ahead of these men. Mm. And even the humility to know that Nelson Mandela has been chosen. I'm number two or three, mm. and I can just be the best number three, and I'm okay with that. Mm. I'm not competing with anybody, but I'm simply fulfilling my purpose in the context. Right? But when God himself, and I know some of you who are here as students or you know, visitors through, you're just this for a while. One day you're going to be probably running for office in the highest office of the land, whichever country God shall take you. The people here perhaps who are not just called for change, but they are chosen vessels. The weight and price of that is going to come with so much criticism, so much persecution. There's always going to be people who were as though designed to misunderstand you. Mm. <laughs> or that if you try to explain, the more you explain yourself, you know, it's almost as though the more you are guilty of a thing. Mm. And that piece that I, I felt God draw me to, that those who hear you understand you most when you say nothing. You know, mm. the lesson that when God has called a people or attracted a people to you and they see you as a chosen vessel, you might not need to explain yourself so much that they'll understand you most even when you kept quiet. So uh, I, I tried in those early years to think that I would find my way of explaining to everybody what this meant, what was the truth behind this narrative. Uh, no, they're lying. You know, I swear upon God, check my texts. <laughs> I had a conversation with this guy in my WhatsApp, and, and this, this was the truth about it, and he's lying. Okay, so what if he's lying? And I go to people with whom you give all the proof in the world, and the guy would still say, no, I don't believe you. They're committed to misunderstanding. Yes, they're committed. So, I, like I, 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 and for the lesson for anybody who will take that place, especially when you find yourself chosen, understand that you're never going to please everybody. Mm -hmm. Understand that, I always tell people that I have a message for the world, but I'm not the pastor for the world. I, I'm not going to pastor the whole world, but I have a message for the world. If I'm not going to be a pastor of a person, I should accept that, that I'm not your pastor. If by God's grace I have a message, in whatever sphere of life God has given me grace, to be able to touch your heart in some way, or say some sense, and improve your version and, and perhaps maybe by the time you walk out you're going to be you know a greater version of yourself then thank god that he's given me that part and i'm not going to fight for man i'm not going to fight to, to to win everywhere and that's okay leaders that's okay and i have and lastly i'll say this some of you who have interacted with corridors of power you have found yourselves in circumstances either observing or yourselves in the place of making decisions that might be contrary to everybody, almost everybody. But again, believe in the power that put you in that office. Believe in the power that ordained you above these men. Believe in the power that chose you. Believe in, in, in the grace and the things that by God's grace have been contributed to establish you in that place. Because sometimes, and, and, and I know Vusi knows this, the, the top can be very lonely, very, very lonely. Because 
not many people are able to relate from where you are. The more you go up, the harder it is to find reference. Mm, you know? Right. And so you in, in a way it, it makes you so vulnerable. But that vulnerability is important because it will always uh, push you to a place of improving yourself every other day because you have nothing to turn to to vindicate you. Mm. And to the end, I think why you find that perfect balance, and this is the perfect balance, and I've already told some of my people who care to hear, that I've gotten to a point where I'm not moved by men's criticisms, but neither am I moved by their praises. Mm. Mm. <laughs> We don't have time for anything. Yeah, so we'll have time for networking after. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I would like to thank our speakers. Thank you, Apostle Grace. Thank you, Busi. Help me. <laughs> we had a great conversation. Uh, a lot of, you know, knowledge that in, and ideas that they dropped in our minds and hearts for us to really ponder on and consider as we take our journey into wherever God leads us to in leadership. We really appreciate you making time to have this conversation with us. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.